everybody for being here. It's a great pleasure um, to welcome our special guest from Assam in India, Dr. Bibam Talukta. He is one of the world's leading rhino experts and particularly um, Asian rhinos. And he is also, because of that, the chairman of the Asian uh, IUCN Asian Rhino Specialist Group. Um, he's a wildlife biologist uh, with a background originally in birds. So there's an interest with NABU. And then he moved to um, mammals. Um, in, since 1996, he's been an expert in, he's been working on rhinos in Assam. Um, he has founded an NGO there that has grown from very small to very substantial called Aranyak. And Aranyak is, uh, means of the forest in English. Uh, and they work, Aranyak, and he'll tell you more about that, works on a wide range of issues from water to rhino conservation and dolphins, river dolphins. Um, and Aranya is also our partner organization uh, that um, NABU International Foundation for Nature has been working with since 2017 in the conservation and protection of rhinos. So with, um, and I forgot to introduce myself, my name is Dr. Barbara Maas. I am <laughs> the head of endangered species conservation at NABU International. Um, I'm also a wildlife biologist and have enjoyed the many years that we've worked together, and without further ado, I'll pass on to our guest, Dr. Talukta. Good morning, and before I jump to the main topic, just to give you a brief background of the, my organization, which was established in the year 1989. So we are you know, working for the past 34 years. We are a registered society. And we are also registered under the Income Tax Act and the Foreign Contribution Protection Act in India. So our main focus area is basically East and Himalayas, including the Northeast India. And we work for different you know, aspect of conservation species conservation. Uh, we are currently having around 140 staff. These are the broad framework to which we are working in different areas related to wildlife conservation, environment protection, and climate change mitigations. As Northeast India is one of the biodiversity hotspot, so you know we owe a lot of responsibilities to cater the needs of the environmental challenges, but we choose our topic very you know minutely based on our expertise, based on the gaps, you know, where we can intervene. And based on that, you know, we are restepping our organizational uh, thematic areas, keeping the broad things in mind. These are our footprints in Northeast India in the past 34 years. We started working, you know, in the neighborhood areas, and slowly, you know, we can see there are a lot of demands to, to carry out our work in Northeast India. Northeast India is having border with Myanmar, border with China, border with Bhutan, border with Bangladesh. So there are four countries, you know, surrounding the, our northeastern part of India. And these are some of the accolades uh, that Aranyak has received over the years based on our work. This is all the teamwork that we always try to you know, uh, promote. Now, coming to the main you know, core issues of rhinos, we have, you know, all of you are quite aware of that there are five species of rhinos. The white rhino, the population has been found declining you know, in the past few years, mainly because of the poaching that is being, you know, uh, severely you know, impacting the population in South Africa. There were, you know, at least five years when South Africa lost 1,000 rhinos per year, meaning three rhinos per day. And that is the result of this decline of the white rhino globally. The black rhino, marginally, its population has increased in, 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 in the African continent, but they are still critically endangered. So these are the two species found in Africa having two horns. Coming back to Asia, we have three species. The Javan rhino is one of the critically endangered species, which is also known as lesser one horn rhino. And it is only found in one national park in Indonesia. Its population is stable and you know we are getting 
yearly, you know, photographs from the camera traps that at least two or three rhino cubs are being born in that particular national park. They are basically the browsers. Sumatran rhino is another critically endangered species. Although, you know, here you can see the figure is what is 80, less than 80. But in the that last scientists, you know, conference of parties, Asian rhino specialist group, African rhino specialist group, and traffic international. Then we put a new figure of 34 to 47. That means the Sumatran rhino population is much below than this 80. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is one of the species we are very much concerned about. Because this is a species sometimes I feel may go extinct if proper, you know, field oriented actions are not put in place. Okay, now. Even in southern Sumatra, there are surveys going on. You know, the, the, the number of Sumatran rhinos has been found declining. The northern Sumatra also the surveys are going on. So I think the best estimate as Ayushan has given 34 to 47 is the, you know, close to the correct estimations because it's very difficult to otherwise you know, estimate the Sumatran rhino population in the wild. The greater one horn rhino itself is a, one of the success stories of rhino conservation. In 2000, till 2008, it was under, you know, category of endangered species under IUCN red list. In 2008, this species has been downlisted, downgraded from endangered to hunger. Now, this downlisted or downgraded, you know, word seems a little negative, but actually it is positive for rhinos. You know, because when, you know, I assume, you know, the charge of the chair, uh, as the chair of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group prior to this redness assessment, I got, in fact, you know, official communication from my government and Nepal government that why it has been downlisted. And I made them understand that it is because of your, you know, proactive effort, the overall condition has improved. And that is why it has been downlisted. And it is good, you know, for the, for, for the, from, from the conservation point of view. Rhino will always remain a protection dependent species, whether its population is 50 or its population is 55. Because there are always, you know, the illegal trade is going on because of its illegal demands in some of the Asian market. So at no point we can be, you know, complacent. The effort needs to be continued, whether we have 50 or whether we have 50. These are some of the figures of the greater one horn rhino, both in India and Nepal. If you can see the left column, you know, the all black color is basically from India. The last four, you know, in the yellow color are basically from the Nepal population. If you see this, you know, table, Orang National Park, you can see 60, then it came down to 46, then again it went to 64. This decline is mainly because of poaching during you know, those six or seven years. That means the bar trade was less than the bed trade. Then Manas and Laupa, you can see we had rhinos during 1980s, but then we lost all of them. This loss is because of socio-political unrest, prolonged socio-political unrest. Prolonged socio-political unrest is not for a day or for a week. It is for years. Okay, and that is the time when we found that the, you know, the illegal wildlife criminals are active. Because they know that during that time, the police and paramilitary forces are busy keeping the law and order situation as good as possible. And then, you know, uh, they can freely, you know, hunt the rhinos. So those are two of the, you know, experiences, bad experiences we had. Then if we can come to other areas, you know, in India, the populations are increasing. But let us focus on treatment, national park and party. From 544 and 104, it has again come down to 435 to 20. The issue is similar. This decline is also because of prolonged socio-political unrest. During that time, Nepal was facing, you know, the socio-political unrest, which is also popularly known as Maobadis, you know, movement. So during that time, their enforcement agencies were also busy dealing with law and order situations and keeping the national parks almost back. So these are three, you know, you know experiences that we had. Now we are working very closely with the, with the enforcement agencies that in future it prolongs socio-political unrest around, around you know, the rhino bearing areas, we should not do the same kind of mistake. But otherwise, the greater one hundred rhinos are good leaders. If they can get good protections, the populations are increasing, as you can see from these people.
So these are the typical grassland habitat where our rhinos are found, along with uh, you know other herbivores. Thanks to rhinos, that most of the grasslands which are being conserved in Assa because of rhino, and because of rhino. The population of tigers has also increased in places like Kajaranga National Park and other national parks like Oran. So I always feel rhino is the epitome of conservation movement in some or in metal in India, wherever the tigers are. Because it, it increases, you know, the stringent protections needed to protect this one of the important, globally important species. The same habitats are also being used by the elephant. We always term elephants and rhino, both are practical, as ecosystem engineer. They make part through these tall grasslands. And then those parts are used by other small herbivores. So if there is no big mega herbivores, you know, herbivores like elephants or rhinos, the smaller animals will also face challenges. And that is why their existence is needed from an ecological point of view. Now, with regards to the rhino, you know, poaching incidences in 1980s also poaching incidences was quite high. But the general awareness among the people was less because during that time, you know, the newspapers reaches people in the even in most of the cities. And now, you know, with the electronic media, the news reaches in five minutes. So there are actions and reactions, you know, from the people. And with efforts being taken since 1996, somebody asked me, you know, why I was, uh, why I got interested from rhino. I was a barter initially from 1989. Then I shifted to rhino because I felt somehow that rhino is a little idiotic. You know? Because any other animal, if you make sound, you know, they will run. Rhino is an animal, they will try to see, you know, like this, giving the soft area, you know, in front of the humans. So then I thought I must do something for this prehistoric animal. And that is how I came, you know, from party to this life. Okay. So and then I started working with, you know, uh, government agencies. We have started different kind of approach, strengthening the ability of the, you know, front range forest guard. Uh, proactively engaging police, and you can see, you know, because of that effort, it has reduced. But again, in 2013, it has increased to 20, you know, in 241. Okay, and that is the time. See, India is a is a is a country where two systems work parallel. One is the executive systems, that is the ministers, government officials, and other is the judiciary. Judiciary in India has taken bold step in trying to protect the sanctity of India's national parks, wildlife sanctuary, and land. In 2013, when rhino poaching increased to 41, the Guwahati High Court has registered a Suomoto case against the Assam government, asking them to give replies whether the action of the Assam government is going to take or has taken in order to reduce this poaching. And that has come because a lot of public voices came in the newspapers. Okay. And as a result of that, Assam government has doubled the strength of frontline forest guard in places like Kajiranga National. Prior to 2012, there were around 600 frontline staff. Now we have more than 30 million. So the great investment that the government of India, government of Assam has made, you know, in order to uh, you know, make the grounds presence by the frontline staff because boots on the ground will only ensure the safety and security of the rhinos and the habitats. And that is what the approach of you know, our Assam government uh, to make you know the protection as clean as possible. And you can see, and during that time, the Assam police had a special task force. The task force meant that priority was basically to contain insurgency. But then Assam government has, you know, bestowed on them the responsibility to reduce the illegal wildlife poaching in, in Assam. And because of all the efforts, and the local communities have also come forward to, you know, support the whole effort, you can see it has gone down from G2, last year it has become zero. Okay, so maintaining zero poaching is a great challenge. It is our dream to maintain zero poaching. 
But I think even if we can contain it to one, two, three, is a two six. Because the demand, it is like a gold, you know, in the open field. And attempts are there. But because of intelligence and network has become strong, those attempts can be prevented before they could be until the right. So from our side, you know, we are doing workshops with the police officers, because police officers also feel that, you know, it's not their primary duty, but we made them understand it is your primary duty, and I'm telling you why. We also made them understand that all the border security forces along the Bhutan border, or Myanmar border, or Bangladesh border, that it is your responsibility to check the legal wildlife crime, same question asked, it is not our, you know, man, you know, our immediate mandate, but then, but the investigations found with regards to rhino poaching cases, there are enough, you know, evidences where rhino horn were exchanged across the border in lieu of illegal arms. And when the illegal arms comes to the country, the country's safety and security can be in jeopardy's position. And we make them understand when the illegal arms comes first, the forest guard is not the first target. The security forces will be the first target. So that's why you cannot ignore rhino incidences like this. It is related with national security. And that is something we did in 2015 in a meeting in Manas National Park, with security agencies, we requested half an hour time where we have convinced them that this is an issue that you know the all security agencies need to complement in order to change. And because of their effort, now we can see some good results. And this effort is to continue. As I said, there's no point of any sort, any sort of complacency. After you know, the engagement of enforcement agencies, another crucial you know, target group is the judiciary. So we engage judiciary that on the left side, these are the two high court judges. They came to our workshops, five district police, paramilitary forces. Basically, in this workshop, it was discussed what kind of challenges the enforcement agencies are facing in court cases. And then high court and you know the uh, judges directs the district judges to take those cases as fast as possible and the fast track court, and also gives the directions, making it a priority in the list of judiciaries, you know, case disposal mechanism. So these are the things that you know we have to bring in order to ensure that it is not just the errors, or it is not the database that we have this many data people's database in our computer. No, we want to go for action. It's time to action, and we have created you know a kind of uh, a platform where enforcement agencies can also you know make actions, and the judiciary also realizes their responsibilities. This is another workshop we did the judiciary seven districts. All district judges, you know, and session district judges came, almost two district judges came, two high court judges, basically again bringing this issue as a priority. Because of this effort, now there are more than 16 district courts in Assam. We have 25 districts. 16 district courts has been marked as the first tech court for white Earlier, wildlife offenses goes on for 20 years. Then just for case, what happens 18 years ago? So that is the reason why most of the cases, you know, we don't get permission. The awareness is very important, you know. The second line of defense in our protected areas are communities. We don't have a fund. The part of the is ants, people's not resistance. So we need to engage, you know, the communities and we need to support them. Sometimes we provide them like DPP, less defense, you know, petrol part, they have left their part work for the police, particularly to maintain law and order situation in, in the villages. So we sometimes provide them, you know, raincoats, torchlight, jackets, shoes, so that they can work and they can also keep their eyes on why they're in the villages. So they are also helping. We have a wellness program called Rhino Postu School or Tiger Postu School. So basically, you know, it collected the minds of the students uh, to, you know, uh, to create in some sort of love for these animals. Now, high poaching has been a major threat. Everybody knows habitat is another important threat which we don't see the impact. Poaching impact we see, you know, right, is right, one is gone, blood is coming, we feel bad. But this is a silent pillar. 
I feel this is a whole long term threat to the rival, and we really need to do something. The primary class of habitats should be something like that. And now you can see because of the creepers and the alien invasive species, plant species, the grasslands are suppressed. Our population, the rhino populations are increasing. And if we lose habitat, it will create more issues. Rhinos may stay out. When they stay out in unprotected areas, they are likely to be killed by creatures. Okay, that is why the habitat management is very crucial. We have started some work, but we feel that you know, this is an area where even you know, national, international donors should come forward to support this because without good habitat, we cannot contain this increasing number of rhino populations. Flood is another issue. I, to me, flood is a blessing. And that is why we say that our rhinos live in flood plain ecosystem. Flood is an annual phenomenon. Flood has been coming every year. I am not too much bothered about, about flood. Okay. We lose some animals, which we, do, we feel bad, but it is also part of the natural selection. We lose some of the animals which, who are, which are probably weaker. But because of flood, we have never seen decline in population of rhinos in the history of Assam or even in other countries. But yes, now the flood situation is becoming a little unpredictable because of a lot of you know, large dams being constructed. So it is difficult to assume you know, the quantity of water that can flow down. Because dams, they really don't announce when they are going to release the water. Natural flood or natural water, we monitor. You know, how, what is the water level in River Brown to 300 kilometers up? So from there coming to into Kajuranga National Park, it takes about 18 to 24 hours. So we can actually you know, prepare ourselves. But with regards to dam releasing water, that may be an issue. So that we need to closely monitor. And with regards to you know the satellite images, they give us very good pictures. Sometimes media also focus, you know, the whole Kajiranga is in such a way that whole of Kajiranga is underwater. No, at no point of time, all areas of Kajiranga is underwater. At least 70 to 75 percent area only under under underwater during high flood. And you can see when I talk about high flood, it's 1988. Others are still compared to. 1988, others are still you know, not that much high. So and satellite imagery gives us a good planning kind of you know uh, thing which helps in decision making. The rhinos are very religious. You know, before flood, they scan the area, especially mother and calf. They somehow found that you know this is the Pobitara ranch where water was there, but as soon as water recedes. The mother and calf came to that area because they earlier saw there are some still some grasses to be used as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. And this is a surface area, nobody disturbs them. Okay, so they are very adaptive. Unless they are not disturbed, they are very peaceful animals. Now, Karanok and Nabu, our you know, handshake started in 2017. And in 2016, I met Barbara in one of the meetings in Singapore, and then we started, you know. Uh, planning the kind of projects that we can do. We started with, you know, the KNH sleeper dogs. The three sleeper dog units are being supported by Barbara, by Nabu. And Barbara has been devoted in, you know, pushing me and to keep the K9 units as active as possible. And that is how, you know, our K9 dog has established themselves as a needed component in rhino getting areas. We also provided field equipment. These are some of the photos we provided in Pobitara Wildlife Sanctuary long back, and our forest minister, Lady C, was also there. We also provide field equipment like motorbikes, you know, so that the forest guards can, can move freely and as fast as possible because sometimes cars may not go in some of the village areas, but motorbikes too. We also provided some excretia to some of the forest guards for field because of, you know, either attacked by the animals or road accidents. So thanks to Nabu for providing the timely help. We also provided a boat camp to Kajiranga National Park, and this is still being in use. Uh, and it, it basically, is the, the, the importance and advantage of floating boat camp is that it can book. Fixed camp on land, it remains there. And every year, you know, the, the Brahmaputra is shifting towards 
towards the you know the northern part of Kazirina. So they generally erode some of the camps. But both camp, if water level decreases, it will automatically go up. When water level decreases, it will automatically go down. So these are very important components which helps Kazirina a lot in you know making the visuals around the peak river. It's the fourth largest river in the world, river from then we also have, you know, we, we received two vehicles from Nabu, and these are mainly for the canine units because they do training, they do movement from one place to another. You know, these uh, cars are very useful. Um, three different sort of trainings have been organized. The first training, this is the pictures of the first training. I'm not putting all the pictures here, but just to give you a glimpse, just recently we had another training, you know, in the hottest month. Uh, in, in April. Uh, so this actually you know, also helps our parents, you know, uh, the team keep them motivated and, and, and keep their energy intact. So we we'll definitely look forward to continue you know, working with NABU. Thanks for your support and for your presence today in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear people. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this first segment of, of our presentation today of our event. Um, and uh, would like to move to invite you to take a seat now um, and um, to, to have a little chat about more things Rhino. <laughs> um, So I want to talk to you a little bit about the main threats around the world. We've already talked about, you know, the rhino one being poached, but could you explain a little bit about what it is poached for? And uh, why the rhino, what, why do people want rhino horns? Well, you know, rhino horns has a market in some of the Asian countries, and it has been used for different kinds of medicines, especially in the traditional Chinese medicines. The major rhino horns from Assam, as per investigation, next goes to you know China. Our rhino so far has not reached to to, to Vietnam as far information is available. Uh, so there are a few countries you know where the demands are. India is producing you know the the rhinos, but the horns are not used in India because it is first it is illegal, and in traditional medicine also you know India has never used you know the the rhino horn. Yeah, yeah. Um... For those of you who don't know, NABU uh, is also engaged, uh, NABU International is also engaged in a demand reduction campaign for rhino horn because you can do a wonderful job with anti poaching as long as there is demand, as long as people want to buy rhino horn. It is very difficult. So I have a different act. I'm also secretary for environment. Uh, and conservation of the International Buddhist Confederation. And we have, over a number of years, I have succeeded in persuading the Buddhist community, um, the International Buddhist uh, Confederation, which is the largest Buddhist umbrella body, to get behind uh, trying to reduce demand for wildlife in Southeast Asia. And we currently have um, a campaign in Vietnam, which is the biggest market for rhino horn, um, in Bhutan and in Mongolia, to reduce the demand. And after that, we're hoping to move somewhere else. This is funded by the International Alliance Against Health Risks in Wildlife Trade. So we are, as, as our organization, tackles the threat from both, from both sides, from both the infield on the ground protection, as well as trying to reduce demand through a value-based system. Because in those countries, there are many Buddhists um, and the Buddhist leaders, rather than Western NGOs are talking to, to their people to say, this is a bad thing. If you're a Buddhist, why you can't use this? It's really not a good idea. Um, so Buddhism, non-violence, more than that, I say. <laughs> So can you um, explain a little bit as well, you know, you have India and Assam and the Forest Department of Police, you have been very successful in curbing poaching. Um, but other parts of the world, in mainly in, in Africa, particularly Southern Africa, um, are struggling to curb poaching. Could you talk a little bit about 
about your views about that? Well, I think, you know, the political will and administrative will is very crucial. If we have the political will and administrative will, it is much easier to maneuver, work with them, complementing their efforts. Number two, our whole approach from NGO side is basically complementing and, and supplementing or assisting not competing. So since we are not competing with any of the government agencies, so they also welcome because they are always can. But to my, you know, uh, comparisons compared to what you have said in African countries, I think, you know, the people's voice matter. The strong people's voice will ultimately compel a you know, good administrative and political support towards, towards the right constitution. Yes. And it should start, you know, one should not get disheartened because to do good work, it takes time. To, good, to do bad work, it doesn't take much time. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, what is also interesting to me is that, of course, India has traditionally been um, against the trade in rhino horn. Um, and India and Asia is not alone in taking that view. Um, do you have um, any comments well, and any information about that, for example, from the other rhino rain states? We organized as a chair of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group. We organized the second Asian Rhino Rain State meeting in New Delhi with the Indian government. The so Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change Government of India was the co-host. In that meeting, all the five Asian rhino rent state, state has officially declared that they will not support any opening of rhino on trade in future. Yeah. So that is the stand of the Asian rhino rent state, not mine. Yeah. It, the Asian rhino rent state declaration was signed by the government representative. So it is the official, you know, uh, the statement made by the five Asian rhino State at the second Asian Rhino Red State meeting in 2019. So, this is very interesting because there are those in um, South Africa, which is the other country which has the most rhinos in the world. They say we can only protect rhinos if we have trade. So, they've been trying to open trade um, for, in fact, they were against the a global ban on rhino horn trade from the very beginning when it came into force. And they have, together with Botswana, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, tried to erode the uh, global ban on rhino horn trade ever since and are still trying to do it. Um, and there's also a fueling of community expectation of a financial gain from this. This we don't have in India at all. Um, and um, so there is a completely different approach towards conservation and wildlife conservation in, in Asia and in India, particularly here, that is very successful. Yet we hear constant voices um, that we need to have financial benefit for um, by, by communities and so on if, if wildlife including rhinos, are protected. There is no other way. Well, there clearly is, which is really encouraging because I think as human beings, we are better, we are better than that, than, you know, directing our decision-making process solely by whether it makes money or not. That doesn't mean that poverty issues don't need to be addressed, but they cannot be addressed by wildlife. Um, One thing I just want to add for the clarity, in Asian context, all the rhinos basically belongs to the government. There is no private parties who can own the rhino. Mm -hmm. Whereas in African continent, you know, some private you know owners are, are, are keeping keeping the rhino. So that's a basic difference that in Asia, all rhinos, you know, the ownership lies with the government. Yeah. I was also really encouraged to hear that she said that there was huge public support for rhino conservation and community support for rhino conservation. Um, in Assam and in India as a whole, and that people identify with their rhinos and they want to see them protected rather than look at them as potential capital. So that is really encouraging. Um, the second, um, and that ties in with what you said when the Indian government wrote to you and said, why are we downlisting the rhinos? Because you are downlisting them for good reasons, while there are others, those interested in trade, uh, are trying to downlist in the CITES context and get rid of protection 
measures and downgrade the protection status of rhinos because they hope it will then be easier to facilitate trade. Um, so it's, it's a completely different approach, but if you look at the hard data, this one works, while the other one doesn't work. In southern Africa, rhinos are dying at the rate of knots. Still, there's a lot of corruption. They have introduced um, lie detector tests for staff in the wildlife department. Um, they, it's, it's, it's a mess because there is an entirely different mindset of that wildlife conservation requires financial benefit rather than wildlife is something that we need to protect. And I applaud you and I applaud the Forest Department, the police and India as a whole for doing such a fantastic job on this. So um, we're coming to the end of our little um, conversation. Um, you wanted, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, to elaborate a little bit more on the flood issue, um, because we know about poaching as a threat. We've heard about the invasive species, but maybe you would like to elaborate a little bit more about the threat um, of the floods and what is happening to, to deal with it, particularly now that many dams are being built both by China, up river, um, and India, um, so that it's no longer a natural situation. Well, you know, means, uh, as I mentioned, flood has many positive aspects, you know, aiding the survival of the floodplain ecosystems and in that case, rhino. Of course, you know, during high flood, we lose rhino. Sometimes we also lost like 30, 34 rhinos during high flood, but most of them were calves or, you know, the, the either otherwise very weaker animals. Or to reduce that kind of, you know, uh, drowning, the Assam Forest Department have constructed few highlands in Kaldirana National Park, also in Pobitara Wildlife Sanctuary. So that gives at least sufficient you know, space at this moment. I think that things will be continued to be monitoring. But one thing I also want to highlight, you know, the solution of flood is not just making highlands. You know, this is, we need to find out that the hydrology, the flow of water are really you know, moving in, in, in the directions that it can go out. That is very important. Sometimes flood water also takes away the water hyacinth from the pond. Okay, and that also clears, you know, the wetland ecosystem. So there are many positive aspects of flood. The only negative aspect is the casualty of animals that we can probably reduce with better, you know, interventions uh, by making informed decisions where, you know, the scientifically made highlands are necessary. Okay. So I think that is being monitored well, regularly. And uh, as I said, you know, means, uh, in any kind of flood, we lose animals, but sometimes it is also part of natural selections, not in making the meaning that stronger animals will survive and stronger offspring will, will come out. But then in the reduction of casualty is also in priority. Uh, so I, 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 I basically, I don't, at this moment, I am not taking that flood as a very serious measure life-threatening issues for rhinos, but yes, since the, you know, the big dams are releasing water, we really need to see, you know, which other areas are more inundated, you know, so that in those areas, you know, without blocking the water flow, how a scientific or few scientific highlands can be climbed. Yeah, I guess what the dams mean for those who are familiar with it is that the water level rises right. far more quickly than it would under natural circumstances. So the animals don't have, have a chance to um, move themselves to safety as much as they would under normal circumstances. So I have one little question for you, Dr. Taluta. Um, if you had a magic wand or a fairy uh, to grant you a wish to help with your work, your wonderful work for rhinos, what would it be? Well, my focus will be always human oriented. You know, we need to probably do more work with humans than with rhinos. And that will ultimately ensure, you know, the conservation and protection of many wildlife, including rhinos. Uh, rhino is easier to contain, but, you know, the human thinking is very difficult, you know, it's very challenging. So I think we need to work more on the human aspect, you know, because wildlife management is easy. Human management is challenging. So, <laughs> you know, and, and most of the threats are basically coming from in human-induced, you know, activities. 
sometimes inactions, sometimes reactions, sometimes actions. So I think, you know, I will continue to give my effort, you know, with the humans. And because if we can even change the attitude of the humans who are killing the rhinos at this moment or who are destroying the habitat, I think we can reduce the threat level to the extent. So my focus would be one species homo sapiens. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Thank you very well, much. It was a very fascinating talk. And I and a great thank you to all of you for being here with us today to share um, in celebrate the wonderful work that is happening in Assam, and we're very proud to be involved and help support it. Thank you very much. Are we continuing or are we fine? Yeah, are there any questions in the room perhaps? No? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in this. Well, also, your final statement was about the concentration on the, on the human uh, perspective. And I'm very interested in how this integrating the local communities work. I mean, of course, you can try to interest them to protect the rhinos as well. But also, you said it's not about financial gain or something, but I guess it's still a, also a question of their economical situation, whether they are endangered in poaching or not, or, or helping criminals. Um, um, structures to poach or something. So I would be interested if this is also um, a part of your works uh, to um, well to help the, the local communities uh, flourish more or also be part of the national parks. And so yeah, we, we have been making some interventions working with the communities. Uh, one of our major intervention was in Manas National Park because Manas National Park was having bad phases during early 90s and the uh, late 90s and early 20s to 2000. So we basically engaged the, the women in the villages, you know, to, to diversify their livelihood options. They are good in weaving, so we also make, you know, some products which are depicting rhino, tigers, and other animals. You know, we have a in a material in, in Assam, when we felicitated people, in any case we, we call Gamosa. So they also we have, so that gives them some extra income. Some people are good with Botari and Tigeris. We have given you know, them that kind of support after training. But we make them very, you know, we make them understandable that we are not a low level agency. So it is a give and take. If we are supporting with training, with some weaving, they have to support in conservation. So in Manas National Park, we did a you know a combined kind of workshop starting from camera traps. Camera traps basically you know gives us data of animals, but it also gives us data of all who are the humans villagers entering into the national park. These you know human photographs are then sent to our awareness you know education team. Education team meets them, try to understand why they are going inside. And then after identifying what kind of other livelihood options they can do without going into the forest, then those people are trained by our livelihood training. Okay, so this is the connecting kind of things we have done in Manas, which is, you know, giving good results. We will do the same kind of things probably in other areas, step-by-step -step process. Uh, we have also earlier worked with the families of the surrender coaches. We give them some, you know, support. Uh, but then again, you know, working with surrender coaches are always challenging you know, because some of them has the tendency to go back to the criminal activities again. So that again, now we are working with police so that if something goes wrong, you know, police is also part of our that program. Okay, so that's something you know we are trying to do. Government has some scheme. The forest department has some scheme like eco development, you know, schemes for upliftment of the people, but. Generally, Assamese people in that sense is not that poor. Okay, every household has, you know, a wetland. Even they can get their own fees from tax. They can get, generally, you know, compared to other parts of, you know, the, the India, especially in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, our people are not that poor. 
Okay, so we basically need to diversify, you know, their their activities. So that is something we are doing. Not only we, there are other, you know, social organizations are also trying to. Right. Um, any other burning questions that you would like an answer for while you have us here? No? Okay. Well, in that case, um, thank you all again for, for joining us today um, online and in the room. And um, and um, you can find more out, can find out more um, about our project by going to our website. Um, and you can also ring the office, you can ring me, you can email me, you can ring our, our team in the office. We are here to help you do it um, wholeheartedly and uh, thanks to the support from people out there, we'll hopefully be able to continue doing it for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.